Welcome to Orthoepidemiology Module 4, Data Integrity and Sources of Bias. Following power analysis and picking your data points, it is important to consider sources of error. This is important in both prospective and retrospective research. Bias will be much more of an issue with retrospective research, but can plague prospective research as well with poor design choices. In observational research, protecting data integrity is of paramount concern. Possible sources of error include considerations of accuracy, bias, confounding, and inconsistency or precision. Accuracy. This can be considered for all numbers, but particularly important for your y or dependent variable and your primary x variable or your test or primary independent variable. A good example of this is, is the Cobb angle. It has a well-known inter-rater disagreement of about 5 degrees. Public obliquity, on the other hand, is another measurement for scoliosis and can have 10 or more degrees of disagreement. Inter-rater reliability of many commonly used classifications is 0.6 or sometimes even lower. Consider using multiple raters and resolving disagreements by discussion. Considering using preset criteria and give raters descriptions of how to perform measurements to minimize variation and improve accuracy of measurement. Well-known classification systems have somewhat lamentable reliability, but I would think they could be improved by giving raters set criteria. Gastil and Anderson for open fractures has an inter-rater reliability that was 0.339 in one study. Gartland for su pediatric supercondylar humerus fractures was 0.679. Schatzker for tibial plateau fractures has a reliability as low as 0.320, and Garden for femoral neck fractures as low as 0.310. Outerbridge has been shown to be 0.5 in raters with less than 5 years experience and 0.7 in those with more than 5 years. This may argue to have more experienced raters rate this value for a study to minimize bias. There are many biases to be aware of. This small list, which is by no means comprehensive, includes selection bias, ascertainment bias, survivorship bias, non-response bias, publication bias, confirmation bias, susceptibility bias, misclassification bias, performance bias, detection bias, transfer bias, and publication bias. Selection bias. Bias in selection of the population may result in a non-representative sample, which can lead to misleading estimates of outcome. A recent example of this can be seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. In Wuhan province, the case fatality rate, i.e. the percent of patients that present with a positive test who die from the infection, was reported to be around 5.8%, although it was later revised down. However, a captive audience, so to speak, in an early cruise ship infected with the virus had a case fatality rate of around 1% in spite of having an older population. How can this be? Are people on cruises more robust? Well, maybe. But an easier answer is selection bias, or in this case, severity bias, i.e. more severe cases get diagnosed, while less severe cases do not get diagnosed. Another way of describing this, this bias is ascertainment bias, which we will get into in a few minutes. So as we mentioned before, the case fatality rate, or CFR, is total deaths over total number diagnosed. Total deaths over total infected is infection fatality rate. If only more severe cases are tested, then the denominator will be smaller. Deaths are more frequent in these cases, so CFR will be higher as a ratio. On the Princess Cruise, there were 3,711 uh, subjects. Everyone was tested. 712 tested positive, which gives an attack rate of 19%. 331 were asymptomatic. 9 died, which gives a case fatality rate of 1.3%. Although this isn't perfect, and has a selection bias because the population was on average older, one would actually expect a CFR lower than 1.3%. So even this sample with perfect testing has selection bias. In practice, ideally your selected population would match your population at risk, or at least the population you're trying to make inferences about. We do this with a consort diagram. 
A consolidated standards for reporting trials, or consort diagram, gives the reader a sense of how cases were selected if they were not consecutive or if there were exclusions. This diagram somewhat mitigates selection bias, although notably, it still does not report cases which were not diagnosed due to ascertainment bias. However, it will demonstrate to a reader that the cases were not handpicked to show a specific outcome. Ascertainment bias is a specific kind of selection bias where only a certain segment of the population is chosen for screening. Hospitalized patients may be more likely to be screened for certain conditions than patients who are being treated at home. This type of ascertainment bias may bias the results of the study towards more severe cases. Similarly, if a hospital has the ability to screen for a condition that others do not, there will be ascertainment bias towards that hospital. We have seen this happen with kingella kinge infection. Only certain hospitals have acquired the technology and know-how to look for this infection. As such, it could be misinterpreted that these hospitals have a higher rate of kingella kinge infection, when in reality the true infection rate is unknown, but the hospitals that screen for it are the only ones that can diagnose it, generating an ascertainment bias towards these hospitals. Survivorship bias can occur because of missing data points. In surgical research, this may occur through the process of competing risks. This is the effect of hidden data that may be present in patients that didn't follow up or that didn't survive until the final analysis. The classic example of this type of bias is that of Abraham Wald. He was a mathematician in World War II who was asked by the government to perform a statistical analysis of bullet holes on returning planes in World War II to figure out where the armor should be placed. You couldn't armor the whole plane because it would be too heavy. Bullet holes on the returning planes were shown to be on the body, the wings, and the tail. The government asked, where should we place the armor? Wald answered, the engines in the cockpit. At first, this seems weird, as the damage was observed in other areas, until one considers these are only the planes that returned. As such, Wald knew that the planes that were destroyed and hence did not return were shot in the cockpit and engine. He knew the hidden data was where the story was at. In post-operative event rates in surgery, this can be a big issue if there's dropouts. The patients may differ in some way from the patients who followed up. Competing risks such as death in older populations must be taken into account as well, as some of the same risk factors may be present in the outcome of interest as with a different adverse outcome that could cause a patient to drop out. Non-response bias is an issue with survey science. It can produce a survivorship bias of sorts in that it is not clear if there is some difference between those who respond and those who do not respond to a survey. This is particularly true if your population of interest has some characteristic which may differentially influence their answers to your question. Consider an example of orthopedic trauma patients where researchers wanted to compare depression to magnitude of injury. Depressed patients may be less likely to respond. As such, you could get a non-response bias. This becomes more of an issue as response rate falls below 70%. One can check for non-response bias by comparing other factors, such as demographics, in respondents versus non-respondents. Susceptibility bias. This is more commonly observed in medicine than surgery. However, it is still important to be aware of, and it fits under the category of consider other possibilities. In observational research, it is important to always remember that findings are correlational and not causal, and so possibilities may be considered as likely as your hypothesized reason for the findings. Susceptibility bias is where one disease predisposes a patient to a second disease, and so the treatment for the first disease is attributed as a risk factor for the second when the second was merely a byproduct of the first. This could be a consideration in NSAID use with nonunion. A few studies using animal models showed that NSAIDs were a risk factor for nonunion. Several su subsequent studies did not show they were a risk factor. As such, if these studies were uncontrolled, the possibility of susceptibility bias must be taken into consideration, i.e. that the fracture itself puts the patient at risk for a nonunion and not a medication they were taking to manage the fracture. Performance bias. Performance bias can happen in cases where blinding is not possible or not well performed. As such, surgical trials are extremely vulnerable to this. A couple different ways this can happen. First, if a patient learns they are in a control group, they may seek other treatment out as an assumption that the trial group is superior. This may result in random statistical noise, or if the treatment they seek is effective, it can bias the results towards the null. 
A second way this can happen is if investigators treat patients differently in different arms, even if unconsciously, i.e. respond more quickly, treat with, within the trial more aggressively, etc. A way to potentially alleviate this is to design cluster stratification in which surgeons at different centers perform only the study procedures they are best at, i.e. if comparing two procedures, patients would be randomized to site rather than to procedure uh, done at that site. As such, each site will still want to look good and so treat their arm in the best possible way. The Hawthorne effect is a version of this and was named after experiments in the Western Electric Factory in Hawthorne, Illinois in the 20s and 30s. Researchers hypothesized that increasing lighting levels would improve work efficiency and productivity. They found instead that either increased or decreased light resulted in more work, and they concluded that the, that the change observed was merely the observation of the subjects and not the intervention. Transfer bias. There is a saying in surgery that nothing ruins your results like follow-up. Transfer bias may be an example of this. It occurs when unequal follow-up is present across arms in a study. Transfer bias is when patients may differentially follow up due to issues they may be having. If dropouts occur asymmetrically or more so in one group than another, you may have transfer bias. An example of this could be an operative versus non-operative treatment of clavicle fractures. Patients who return late may be having symptomatic hardware, whereas non-operative patients may be going about their life and may or may not be having symptoms but the symptoms just may not rise to the level of seeking care. It would be erroneous to assume they are doing perfectly, but they may just think there's nothing that can be done. Detection bias. This bias represents a systematic difference between how groups are assessed. Researchers want a positive study. These studies get published more often, so there will be a desire to show a difference. As such, detection bias can differentially affect how subjects are assessed based on the group they are in. Detection bias may be protected against by blind, blinding, by using impartial raters like therapists not involved in the study, and by using defined methodology for measurement. Subjective measures such as pain are specifically vulnerable to detection bias, but can be mitigated against through impartial collection methodology like text-based applications. Confirmation bias. Perhaps the most insidious type of bias is confirmation bias. This is present in everyday life and is part of human nature. It is tempting in observational research to conclude something we believe to be true. It is critically important to remember that observational research is correlational only. It is vitally important to consider other alternative explanations for the observations. Randomized and higher level studies help to control for this. The example given in module one of this series regarding the forest plot with different results for different levels of evidence could be potentially an example of this. Surgeons comfortable in to total joints may feel they are doing a better thing for a patient with their total hip versus hemiarthroplasty. As such, level 3 studies can show a result that is favorable to THA versus one, level 1 studies, which show no difference. This could be unconscious confirmation bias too, or it could be performance bias. Publication bias is what I would call a meta-bias. It is not a bias that one one study can have on its own, but rather a bias the literature as a whole can have. In a sense, it can be a little bit more dangerous because you never know it's there. Publication bias is where studies are published based on the strength and direction of their results. Using PubMed, Embase, and the English language make this worse. A funnel plot can potentially show this bias. If you plot all the studies about a subject on a graph, the results should cluster around the mean effect size. If the study is smaller, it should have more variance and may give either a higher or lower value than the mean. If there are more patients, the values uh, should converge towards a mean as the studies get larger. Plotting these results would result in a funnel shape. If there is no publication bias, as in the top picture, a symmetrical funnel is formed. An asymmetric funnel implies that studies that are small and negative have not been published, which is called the file drawer effect or publication bias. Programs exist to adjust for these effects in meta-analysis. Misclassification bias. Misclassification bias can be a very big problem, particularly in very small studies, particularly if your outcome variable, your Y or dependent variable is misclassified, or your primary independent variable of interest is misclassified. Definitions must be exceptionally clear and well-defined and easy to diagnose. Surgical site infection is a classic example of a metric which is important but difficult to diagnose and classify. 
Add on top of that, hospitals are incentivized not to diagnose them, and you have yourself a recipe for disaster when looking retrospectively to study surgical site infection. Consider the example at the bottom of the slide. Suppose you're investiga investigating an intervention to prevent surgical site infection in 100 patients, 50 who received the intervention and 50 who did not. Now suppose you found two infections in your intervention group and eight in your control group. You would conclude that the intervention was effective with a p-value less than 0.05. Suppose just one non-infection in the intervention group was considered an infection. Say you misclassified one infection as a non-infection or your definition of an infection change. So now you have three infections in the intervention group and eight in the control group. You would conclude that the intervention was ineffective with a p-value of 0 0.200. This is an example of how misclassification can change the results of studies and also how studies with small sample sizes are more fragile to this type of bias. Confounding is not necessarily biased per se, but it can heavily influence the results reported in observational studies if not controlled for. By definition, confounding is the tendency of a third variable or second independent variable to influence the relationship of x to y, the dependent variable to the independent variable. Consider a study where you wanted to assess the risk of Xbox on the development of slip capital femoral epiphysis in children. You found that the more hours a child played Xbox, the more likely they were to get skippy. Is this a true effect? Does Call of Duty cause slips? Well, probably not. Children who play more video games are less likely to play outside physically and as such be more sedentary and have weight problems, which is known, a known risk factor for Skippy. In randomized trials, randomization parses out other risk factors into groups by random chance. The larger the sample, the more likely confounders will be randomly allocated in an equitable fashion so as not to influence the results of the trial. In non-randomized observational trials, confounders must be accounted for as well. There are three ways this can be done. A result can be stratified by a certain confounder. This works well for effect modification, which we will talk about next. You can match cases with controls by confounding factors, though an issue with this approach is that if you do this, the effect of a confounder cannot be assessed. Lastly, you can adjust for confounders. This is the most complicated way from an analytic perspective, but maybe also the best. It allows you to fully ass assess the effect of the confounding variable and also allows you to assess the total amount of variance that is accounted for by the model. In linear regression, we use R-squared to assess this, and in logistic regression, an area under the curve can be generated for the prediction model. Effect modification. Effect modification is a special type of confounding where different levels of the variable affect the outcome in a synergistic uh, fashion with a primary regressor of interest. A common example of this is a smoking and asbestos on lung cancer. These two are synergistic for each level of smoking. One can consider in a regression adding a combination variable or asbestos times smoking. If this variable adds significantly to the R squared and is an independent predictor, significant and multivariate, it is likely evidence of effect modification. Data consistency is super important. This is particularly true in multicenter studies which I have come to learn the hard way. Data dictionaries are incredibly useful in this regard. Smart people can interpret a requested data point differently, so in multi-center multi studies, no room for ambiguity can be allowed. The data dictionary should include things like units of the variable, technique of measurement, when the data should be measured, even significant digits. A well-designed data dictionary will save you scores of back-end hours trying to clean the data. Discrete fields are more helpful than free text fields, and always validate data which don't make sense. If you have questions, please place them in the comments section.